Hello, I'd like for us to explore a little bit about why it is that the uncharged objects, both the foil and the paper, ended up attracted to both the top tape and the bottom tape. Uh, this is not the same kind of behavior as top and bottom tapes where they either attract or repel depending on what we bring it near, but they're both attracted to top and bottom. And so they cannot be charged um, because if the foil were charged, then if it attracted to the top, then it would be pushed away by the bottom and vice versa. Same thing with the paper. Uh, the idea here, um, I think I want to show a little simulation first. Uh, here I have a balloon and a sweater. Now they both are made up of things that are composed of atoms. So there are already positive and negative charges already there in each object. Uh, there's also a wall off to the right, but we won't worry about that quite yet. Um, now this simulation here, um, having a positive ball and a negative ball sitting next to each other is not what we think of when we think about uh, the structure of atoms, but this is just here to show us, just to help us count charges. Um, so it's not meant to be an accurate representation of what an atom looks like, but we can see that the balloon has equal numbers of positive and negative stuff, just like any ordinary atom. Same with the sweater, same with the wall. But if I bring the balloon over to the sweater and rub it against the sweater, now the balloon takes negative charges, electrons, from the sweater, and now the balloon has more negative charges than it has positive charges. And because the balloon took those from the sweater, now the sweater has fewer negative charges than it used to have. And now the sweater is left with a positive charge because it's got more positive things than negative things. Um, they are attracted to each other. So if I let go of this balloon, the balloon moves over to the sweater. But the thing that I really want to explore right now is what happens if I move the balloon towards the wall. Now the balloon is charged and the wall is not charged. The wall has equal numbers of positive and negative stuff. And as I move the balloon closer and closer to the wall, maybe you can already see that the negative charges in the wall are creeping a little bit away. I'll move the balloon back. And you can see that as I move the balloon, the electrons that were already in the wall, because they're pushed away by the negatively charged balloon, then they move back. They move away from the balloon. Now, the positive charges in the wall are attracted to that negative stuff, but they can't move. Protons in atoms are locked in place, but the electrons are not locked in place. And so if I move the balloon all the way over to the wall, then we can see that uh, there's a section of wall here where the electrons have moved away. And as the electrons have moved away, the positive stuff of the wall is attracted to the negative balloon. So there's an attractive force between these positives and the negative balloon. Now, we should also notice that there are just as many negative charges in the wall as there were before. But those negative charges are farther away. Those negative charges do push away on this balloon, but we've seen recently that with electricity, just like gravity, the strength of a force is dependent on how far away those objects are. And since the negative charges are farther away, from the balloon, then the positive charges are the wall from the balloon, then the pushing force, the repelling force between the negatives of the wall and the balloon, that push is smaller than the pull between the positives of the wall and the balloon. So there's a small attracting force, there's a small net force. This balloon is slightly pulled and even smaller slightly pushed away. And so the slight pull wins out over the even smaller push. And so there's a small attracting force between the balloon and the wall. And you can see when I let go, 
that the balloon does get pulled over to the wall. Although if I go much further away, the attraction to the positively charged sweater is larger, even when the balloon's closer. But this idea is what we call polarization. Polarization is the shifting around of charges within a material. The protons do not go anywhere, but the electrons do. And this is the key difference then, how they polarize between a conductor and an insulator. Because the foil's a conductor, then those free electrons in the valence shells can go from one atom to another. And so, say, the nearest, if that wall were made out of aluminum, let's say, that's a metal, then atoms from the front edge of the wall would move into the atoms next door, and then from those atoms, electrons would move to the side, and from those atoms, electrons would move and repeat that process, and we have electrons shifting from atom to atom across the entire metal wall all the way over. But if we were looking at, say, a piece of paper, the electrons can't move from atom to atom in a piece of paper. They're stuck in their atoms. So in that situation, the individual atoms would polarize, but individual atoms polarizing is a much smaller scale. And so, sure, there are a lot of atoms that each polarize, but on the whole, there's going to be less charge movement, less shifting of charges, less separation of how close are the positives of the wall to the balloon versus how close are the negatives of the wall to the balloon, or replace the wall with a piece of foil, replace that with a piece of paper. So that's why we see that the force is larger, the attractive force is larger with a charged object and a conductor versus a charged object and an insulator. Now we see that they are attracted to both top and bottom. Now in the simulation here, we saw what happened when I bring a negative charge near a neutral thing. But if I brought, I can't move the sweater in this simulation, but if I had brought the positively charged sweater over instead of the balloon, then all those blue electrons in the wall would have shifted to the left. The blue electrons in the wall would have shifted closer to a positive charge, which would leave the attracting stuff closer and the repelling stuff farther, just like we're seeing with the negative balloon. And so electrons will shift towards or away, depending on what charge is brought near them. And either way, the stuff that's pulling will be closer, the stuff that's pushing will be farther, so the net force will always turn out to be attracting. And polarization is the name that we give to that idea of the charges shifting around. I also want to revisit the similarities between how gravity works and how electricity works. I could describe each of these as a fundamental interaction of nature uh, between uh, things that have fundamental properties, either mass or electric charge. And any two things in the universe that have mass will do this thing we call gravity to each other. Any two things in the universe that have this property we call charge will do this thing we call electricity to each other. And so with those two objects, I multiply the amount of those two properties, whether it's mass, whether it's charge, divide by the distance between them squared, and then I multiply by some constant that makes the units work out. And so structurally, these two are really very much the same except that uh, the constants are very different from each other. The gravitational constant, as we've discussed in class, is a very, 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 very tiny number, 10 to the negative 11th power, uh, when we're using MKS units, gives us a number that's way, 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 way less than one, whereas the electric constant, which is new for us, 
nine times 10 to the ninth power, that's nine billion. And that is a very, very large number using corresponding units to give us Newtons. And so the electric constant is a very large amount. The gravitational constant is a very small amount. And in general, electric forces are way, 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 way stronger than gravitational forces are. Although on the scale of big things in the universe, it's gravity that wins. And thinking about why does gravity win on a large scale, uh, the answer is because gravity only pulls, whereas electricity pulls or pushes. If we think about, say, the moon and the earth, every single thing that makes up the earth pulls every single thing that makes up the moon. But that's not true with electricity. Of all the things that make up the earth, there's basically the same number of positive things, protons, as there are negative things, electrons. Same with the moon. And so all the Earth's protons push all the moon's protons and pull all the moon's electrons. All the Earth's electrons push all the moon's electrons and pull all the moon's protons. And so if we think about the forces on the moon from the Earth electrically, there are just as many pulls as there are pushes from all the protons and electrons. And so the net electric force between the Earth and the moon is zero, even though there are lots of charged things pulling and pushing each other. But with gravity, we don't have that issue because all of the stuff is pulling when we're thinking about gravity. Um, something that blows my mind every time I think about it, thinking about how electricity is so much stronger than gravity, um, and, and a way of visualizing how strong electricity is in comparison. If I stand on the floor in my house, the whole world, which is larger than I can even imagine, is pulling on me gravitationally. And there are two tiny foot-sized patches of floor that push back up on me. And I say tiny just, you know, compared to the earth. Um, two foot-sized patches of floor push up on me, balancing out the pull of the whole world. And so that normal force from the floor balances the whole world pulling on me. We've known that for ages. Um, but something that maybe you haven't thought about is the fact that that normal force from the floor pushing on your feet actually is an electrical force. Um, all of our contact forces are really electrical in nature. Uh, we think about how a normal force is squishing of molecular bonds. Well, all of the forces involving molecular bonds at their essence are electrical interactions. All of the forces involved in chemical interactions are electrical forces. Um, stretching and squishing bonds are electrical interactions. And so those electrical interactions in two foot-sized patches of floor are enough to counteract the pull of the whole world on me. And yeah, that is something I enjoy thinking about because I think it's cool. Last thing I want to uh, get into, uh, thinking about some of the work that you had, uh, calculating numbers. If I have negative 20 coulombs worth of charges being transferred in a lightning strike, and it's negative because it's electrons doing the moving, uh, then how do I do a calculation to figure out how many electrons that is? And I see this essentially as a unit conversion. And whenever I'm converting units, what I'm basically doing is multiplying by a fancy version of one. I'm multiplying by a fraction where the numerator and denominator are equal. Like if I wanted to do a conversion from kilometers into meters, then I would multiply by 1,000 meters divided by one kilometer. 1,000 meters and one kilometer are identical to each other. They're equal. So when I multiply by 1,000 meters over one kilometer, 
I'm basically just multiplying by a very fancy looking version of one that gives me a different unit in the end. But we do know that we need to be mindful of where do we put things in the numerator or denominator to get the units to work out correctly. So here I've got two numbers that are equivalent, the charge of one electron and the charge of one electron, just the number here negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs is expressed in terms of that unit coulombs. And this one electron charge is just expressed in a unit where we say each electron has one. That's how you did your counting when you took chemistry. So I just need to put one of these numbers in the numerator and one in the denominator. But if I think about where I'm starting from and what I'm trying to end up with, I want to divide out the coulombs so that needs to be in the denominator. And when I put one electron charge in the numerator, then the coulombs will divide out and I'll be left with a number of electron charges. And since each electron has one electron charge, then how many electron charges there are is how many electrons there are. Now, one way that you can tell before we come up with an answer there, if you did this upside down, when you carry out this calculation, you're gonna get a number that's something like 3.2 times 10 to the negative 18. And a way that you can tell if you stop and think about, does my answer make sense? A way that you can tell that that can't be true is that if you did that, then you would end up getting a number that's much, 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 much less than one. 10 to the negative 18th power is way less than one. You're saying that a lightning strike is less than one electron, and there's no way that that's happening. Besides, as far as we know, uh, we can't break up electrons into tinier chunks. So getting a number less than one electron is, as far as we know, physically impossible, and thinking about a lightning strike is also completely unrealistic, even if you didn't know that you can't have less than one electron charge. So our correct way of doing this would be to put, would be to put the uh, charge of the electron in coulombs in the denominator because the charge in coulombs then is in the denominator here multiplied by coulombs there is going to uh, divide out to eliminate that unit. And I'm stalling for time a little bit there. I was having a little delay, but now we're good. And that gives me my answer then of 1.25 times 10 to the 20 electron charges when I carry out this math, negative 20 times one, divide by negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Uh, one other thing to be careful of, the way that you enter it into your calculator, if you don't have parentheses around this number, or if you're not using that little capital E button for powers of 10, uh, then you might have an order of operations mistake in your calculator. But this number, 1.25 times 10 to the 20, 10 to the 20 is a lot. That's a very, very, very large number, which I would expect a very, very, very large number of electrons in a lightning strike. So if we do the same thing with question B, I have 2 times 10 to the 13 extra electrons. And I want to know how much charge in coulombs that has. So I want coulombs as my answer for my output. So I'm going to multiply by a fancy version of 1 where I wanna divide out electrons. So I put the electrons in the denominator and I want coulombs in the numerator because that is the number, how many coulombs that I'm trying to find. And I realize now that I accidentally left out my negative sign, there we go. So it's a negative charge because each electron is negatively charged. So in this case, I'm multiplying how many electrons times negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 divided by one. And uh, 
electrons, that divides out and I'm left with coulombs. So I hope that was helpful and it was good talking to you. I will see you some other time.